I am speaking with poet, educator, and activist Caroline Harvey. Harvey has taught at Berklee College of Music for over a decade. Harvey has been a member and a coach of a number of nationally acclaimed Poetry Slam teams. They have shared stages and classrooms with Alicia Keys, Livingston Taylor, and Melissa Ferrick. Harvey most recently wrote and read their poem, To Speak of Grief, for the Cape Ann Museum Memorial Event marking this community's year of loss. They are also co-owner of Dogtown Books. Caroline, Cape Ann is also your community. Can you give us a little personal history of your connections here? Sure. My grandparents uh, in the early 50s, uh, my grandfather was an attorney, mostly civil rights work in Albany, New York. And he got in the car with his wife, my grandmother, Alice. And they said, we're just gonna drive until we hit the ocean and we'll stop there. Uh, so they, they drove, they ended up here and they bought a cottage with another family over on, uh, right near Niles beach. And that was kind of our first roots here. So then my, um, my father and his brother, my uncle spent a lot of time here. And, and while we kind of started then as, um, summer folks, it progressed to the point where, um, we felt more and more at home here. So my brother and his wife live here uh, and I live here with my partner, Lucas. Um, and my parents are, are slowly moving here full-time as well. Nice, nice. But your yeah. childhoods were really spent coming here for summer. Oh, absolutely. Summers and also um, about a month in the winter and every other weekend, you know, as much as we could. We, were, we rented at first uh, in Lanesville on Plum Cove. So a lot of my memories are embedded in tide pools over there. Uh, like so many people. That's yes, cool. exactly. Um, and in 94, my parents were able to buy a home here so we could be here more permanently. Mm. But yes, much more, um, much more of my alive memories of, of being a kid and being connected to neighbors and community activities were here where where we lived in new york was quite remote so it was um it was social and it was connected and it was uh just an active summer and then yeah i mean anyone who comes here wants to come here more so what was summer became full-time <laughs> So when the Cape Ann Museum commissioned you to write something for this memorial service, it was fitting. You understood this. Hmm. And I, I think that's so important. Um, I mean, research is key, I think, to writing. And, and I don't mean that in a, in a small academic way. Um, research, I mean, just just recalling and recollecting and really living within what you're writing about. And I do think for something like this important memorial um, and for a place like Gloucester, it is important to really understand so much of the history of, of who we are. Um, you know, I, I don't like to say, I, I don't, I don't want to cut anyone out of our community. You know, we, we are a small community and I know that that can sometimes be tough. Um, my, my partner uh, wasn't born or raised here and we always joke that people ask him, you know, oh, what's your last name, you know? Trying to figure out if he's from here. Um, so I think there's room for people to, to engage even if they don't have, have generations of roots. But for me, um, because of the, the losses, uh, the COVID related losses, and of course, um, in my mind as well, were the other losses within the community that may not have been COVID related, but, but we were not able to have services or ceremonies or any public recognition for, for any of the losses. Um, and then of course, because the memorial itself, the, the sculpture installation was made of granite and to, live in Cape Ann is to understand the role of granite in, um, you know, as, as a livelihood, right? So, so, you know, fishermen that weren't working in the winter were dealing with granite and um, Cape Ann was the first to uh, understand how to create slabs so that the granite could be used in paving. And in that way, Cape Ann is, you know, 
all over the country in terms of um, making roads and making pathways. So I did feel like my personal connection was huge for that. And you have process. a beautiful line about granite. Can you, mm. is it too hard for me to call on you to recite that line? No, but you'll have to give me a little hint. Um, uh, let's see. Heavy, we made it so heavy. Oh yeah, so, so I talk about, uh, one of the last stanzas I talk about, and this was something I had to research because I, you know, I know about granite here in Cape Ann, but I'm not a geologist. So I said, wait a minute, you know, where did granite come from? How old is granite? So um, there's a stanza about the continents colliding and um, you know, there's a lot of imagery in the poem about crashing and um, mess versus order and um, kind of what, what happens when we run into unexpected things. Um, so the line uh, I believe is um, once immovable mountains folded like note paper. Uh, I'm forgetting that part, but it's something like what um, the weight turned into pressure, unimaginable and immense and what was underneath crystallized into granite. And our great, great grandfathers rested that granite from the ground, raised what was buried into the light of day. And then I talk about how we built this monument out of granite and um, in a, in a very uh, non-metaphorical way, the, the pieces are very heavy. And as the installation was getting built, there was a call for volunteers to go and, and help carry it. Um, and, and Miranda, who had originally invited me to be a part of this memorial, she, she called on me. Unfortunately, we were buried in, um, buried in not granite at the time, but in books, because we work at a bookstore, we'd just gotten a huge donation. So I wasn't able to come out and help, but I really thought about this process that the museum had, had put together with the artists of let's make this thing, except it's absolutely impossible for anyone to do it alone. And that felt, um, that was one of the lines that really, I said, oh, that has to be in the poem. Like it, it wrote itself and it's, you know, and, and um, I think the line is really, um, we made sure it was too heavy to carry alone, which is also, of course, the nature of grief. Um, and that at times we, we have, we have to carry our own burdens. And sometimes in grief, we can, we can curl into quietness or shame and, and feel that we're alone in it, um, especially during these uh, pandemic days where we can't gather and, and, and have services for, for each person. Um, so there was a lot of aloneness. And I thought, you know, this memorial, even though we can't hug or be too close to each other, we, we made this thing together, you know, and it's these pieces of rock balanced on each other. So none of them can really exist without the other. And there's this, this group process um, and this, I don't know if this is part of the intention, but just the heaviness of it was really important to me because I, I think that's, the nature of grief, right? There's a physical heaviness. Hmm. Well, I, I think that was just so beautifully said. And I have one more Thank question you. for you, basically yes. about uh, public poetry. You know, yes. we were all so inspired by Amanda Gorman at the presidential inauguration. And I think a lot of people, including myself, were reminded of the power of poetry to say things in a way that other mediums can't. So do you yes. want to, and you have just given us this beautiful, powerful, incisive poem. Do you want to talk a little bit about the role of a public poem? I do. Um, and, and I feel so grateful to Amanda and Amanda's poem um, and also to, to her public platform, which she's continued to use to really speak out about uh, her identity and um, anti-oppression work and um, what it means to be, to live out loud um, and, and how that is a real threat to traditional systems of power. Um, so I think one of the reasons I came to love the performance of poetry is it, um, and really I think some of why Poetry Slam got so popular is that like many things, um, 
poetry was starting to get uh, guarded and it, there was some gatekeeping where it, poetry became this academic thing. And there was this, uh, even with myself and you know, I taught at an art school for, for many years, there's this feeling that poetry <clears throat> is this thing that's like for smart people or you, know, you have to have a great vocabulary or we don't understand it. Um, you know, and of course that's the way my father feels when he listens to rap music, right? There's, it, it, it has nothing to do uh, with your intelligence or your education. It's really just poetry and lyricism is a language of the people. So what was a colloquial word, you know, when Shakespeare was writing um, or whoever was Shakespeare was writing, there were just different words that were popular. So, so what we understand is that songwriting poetry is really a voice of the people. And I started to, you know, I fell in love with poetry when I was 14, 15 and, and, um, you know, listening, you know, my older brother was turning me on to, you know, the Grateful Dead and Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin, which of course, you know, led me to the beat poets. And here they were just saying words, just actually telling a story and representing a, a whole time and a whole movement. So for me, um, I, I love word and rhythm. And for me, it's really important. Uh, I think, and I'm thinking out loud, but I think what I mean to say is that what's most important to me is communication. And by communication, I mean connection. Um, th this idea that we there, there is a universal thread within humanity, which is of course not to disappear identities uh, or difference or a multitude of, of culture, but there is, I believe also uh, a thread of humanity and communication is key to that. And so when I began to write poems and feel like I have, um, I like to say I have a lot of flaws, but, um, I, I'm all right at writing poetry, right? Like we all we all have our things. Um, so I realized that, especially as I began teaching more and more, that the written word is is one kind of communication. Uh, adding rhythm into that is something else, and then also figuring out how to how to use sound is something else. Uh, figuring out how to use gestures, and now of course over time I've had students. Um, who are blind, students who are deaf. And so I've had these opportunities to really learn about what are all the ways we can connect. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a radical, radical left-leaning liberal. So to think that the written word, especially in English, you know, is the end all be all, for me, it's not. We, we can do so much communicating with our breath, with our eyes, with our hands, um, with the vibrations and tones. And so for me, that poetry is always performative. Even if you're reading it, you're hearing something inside your sonic ear. So in, in a time, it's always been important, but it does seem even more now that, that we need to and are longing to connect and to, to touch into that common thread. And so why commandeer things into books why, why charge money? Why, you know, why keep it trapped and away when, you know, the West didn't invent poetry. We didn't invent storytelling. Uh, we didn't invent dance. So why not um, celebrate that? And, and, you know, like Amanda and like, so, you know, Amanda, as amazing as Amanda is, of course, she stands on the shoulders of so many that have come before us. Mm. Um, and what a gift to see someone presenting like Amanda presents and, and young, you know, it's like, yeah, we, we are going to continue this tradition. So I, I could say lots more clearly, but um, why not be public? Why, why hide? Yeah. Why close the door? So do you think we'll be able to have more of this on Cape Ann? Yes. <laughs> yes. And yes. Make that happen. Right. If I have anything to do with it. Yes. And, uh, you know, the best thing I can say is just um, if, if you want to start writing and you feel silenced, write about what silences you. And that's a really beautiful place to start. 
Really nicely said. So your poem, a uh, section of it can be seen and heard on the 1623 Studios Instagram page. Yes. The entire recitation, the entire reading can be seen and heard on the 1623 Studios YouTube page where the mm -hmm. whole memorial service is. But tell us more about how to find Caroline Harvey, how to read more of your work and how to learn more about you. Yes, thanks. So my personal website for my um, poetry and teaching is caroline dash harvey.com and I'm, I'm sure we'll embed a link here somewhere um, and you can read a bit more about my process and why I do what I do um, and there's links to videos and there I'll have um, you'll be able to find the performance from the COVID memorial as well as the text and you can also find me and my other work at dogtownbooks.com which is our bookstore which we really think of as uh, a meeting place and a a, a place to inspire more writing and reading. So I'll provide a link for the poem there as well. Great. Well, I really recommend that people listen to you read the poem and also read the words on the page. There are two different experiences, but they're both really important. So Thanks, thank Heather. Thanks so much for talking to us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.